Distractions. Distractions. It's the year 33. I live in the city of Jerusalem. Like most people, we do a little bit of everything, anything. I work the fields. I harvest crops. I take care of distribution. I take care of gardens. I even help people construct their homes, do repairs. You know, even as a community in Jerusalem, we take turns shepherding. Make sure that we all take turns to help one another. You know, actually, actually I live in the southern part of Jerusalem. I live right next to the pool of Salon. I live right across the street. It's a beautiful place. It's actually a very Jewish town. I'm probably the only Gentile living in that section. You may remember that pool. Remember that story? There's a blind man walking with blood on his face, if you will, on his eyes. He's being followed. I remember, it must have been 30 or 40 people. Imagine a blind man leading people who can see what they said was everlasting life. They walk him all the way to the pool. And when he gets to the steps, I was standing there. I knew him from his birth. He was blind. I know that. He literally walks down the steps. And when the water begins to rise as he steps into the pool, he literally just submerges. And then when he comes up, he begins to wipe his eyes. He was blind. But now he can see. You should have seen the commotion, the ruckus, the screams. I couldn't even get close enough to him. It was, it was pandemonium. And then I heard someone say, that was the work of the, the Messiah. I'll never forget that day. I digress. I'll actually never forget this particular day. I've been living in Jerusalem most of my adult life, and I live in a little 10 by 10, well, you can call it a house. It's made of rock, and I actually fill the openings with moss and clay. The roof is made of thatch. It may not be much, but it's mine. Um, again, I'm the only Gentile living in the city of Jews. And I admit, when it rains, it gets a little damp in there. I mean, I don't make a whole lot. And sometimes the forest made of dust, but it gets a little damp. You know, I got a little table. It's not much bigger than that. I had two chairs, a candle. I actually have a window right next to the door. I put some cloth in. I have a few shells on the fourth wall. I have no knickknacks. I live off the essentials, utensils, bowls, fabric. And right below it, it's just, some, it's just my bed made of hay. But you know, it was such a beautiful night. I can remember the night because I sometimes would go and I would lay up on the roof in the thatch. And I remember looking up and saying, that has got to be the most clear sky I've ever seen. Everything was so clear. I remember looking at the stars. You could almost name different stars. I remember thinking, man, they're so distinct. They, they seemed to illuminate the whole ground. You, you didn't even need a torch to walk. The sky was almost like a bluish black. Now a cloud for miles. It's not even a bad breeze. And I remember thinking, wow, this is so beautiful. And I remember thinking, maybe it's a calm for the storm. I came down, it was about 8, it's getting late. I decided that man, it's time to call it a night. I go into my house, I prepare a little bit to get ready. And they hear a knock on the door, and I remember thinking, man, it's awfully late. And the doors back in the day are not those that attach on hinges like you and I know. It's, it's much different. But it does its purpose. I open the door. Well, there's John. John, if there's anybody in all of Jerusalem that everybody loves, it's John. He is pure love. He wouldn't hurt a fly. He wouldn't even think of hurting a fly. I bet you if you went door to door and asked every couple getting married who their best friend was, it would be John. 
He radiates a love. He comes and says, will you, will you come with me to a meal tonight? And I started to laugh and said, John, I'm the only Gentile in the city. We live next to the Essenes. That's very strict Jews. As a matter of fact, John is close to slim with John the Baptist way back in the day. Well, he was in the scene, the very strict. He said, I want you to go to a Passover meal with me. And I'm thinking, well, I'll go with you, John. He was so excited. He was like a young boy. He was, like, he, he was just amazing, the energy. Yeah. We walked down the road. I bet it's not 10 foot wide. It's just dirt. And then we looked at the different houses. Some had candles lit in the window, some were in darkness. Some of the families that were able to build up a little fence to hold their sheep. You look out into the fields, you see the shepherds banging it. And the road would run directly into this two-story white house. And it's almost as if the stones were whitewashed. They had a big oval-shaped door, if you will. It's a beautiful door. It had matching windows, two downstairs and two up. And there was stairway going up and left. John was telling me that it's a Passover meal. And I remember telling him, John, you know, I wasn't invited. And he said, oh, but please come. Come, come as my guest. So we go up into the room. The room is about 30 feet by about 15 feet. And inside the room is the shape of a table and a U. They got one main chalice. Chalice of carpenter. You see all the couches on the outside. And the inside of the U, there's a table, there's a, there's a bench. I bet it's not much smaller than this. So John and I go in. And he begins to explain to me that if you should sit on the bench, make sure you lay with your feet off the back. Make sure you lean on your left hand and only eat with your right. And as a result, only eat when something is passed in order to do something is to drink. As we're waiting, the apostles begin to enter. First is his brother James. And you can tell they're brothers. You can see it. You would swear they hadn't seen each other in years. That embrace is only that of a brother. It was John is pure heart. Andrew is a little more at distance. But you can tell the commitment. Now I'm not saying that, if you will, that James wasn't good to me. He was very kind. He shaved my hand. You can tell it was out of position. You can tell that his clothes that may not have been much, may not have been money, but they were clean. But he wasn't as open as John. But he welcomed me to the table. And then I realized He'll die in a few years, about a decade more. He'll be beheaded. And then no sooner than James had come in, and then comes Andy, Peter's brother. Man, he's nothing like Peter. Peter's very gregarious, very outgoing, very outspoken, very direct. Andy's just the opposite. He's a constant introvert. He's the one that just needs to keep things to himself. But man, him and John must have been given spirits. Because they embraced as if they had known each other their entire lives. They probably had to fish together. But just like James before him, the clothes were simple. You could tell he used his own fishing line to repair them. He was very pragmatic. But I'll tell you this. He gave me a very respectful bow and thanked me for coming to pray with him. He comes in and he goes to take his seat. Then comes in James the lesson. You know, I heard about James. They said he's the one that if you ever ask somebody to pray for him, James is the one you want. I gotta tell you, I try not to be conspicuous, but it's kind of hard not to want to notice. They said his knees were like camel skin. That when he would go to, to, to pray, he would, he would he, whether it was the middle of the street, the middle of the day, the middle of the night, in the middle of the marketplace, if you said, Would you pray for me? James the Lesser would have dropped and prayed immediately. And man, you can tell he's all about prayer. Man, my brother, sister in Christ, he's very cordial. You can tell he's got a keen intellect with him. Him and John spoke about some things. But man, he's very cautious, very guarded, but also very welcoming. No sooner than he comes and goes to his chair, then John and I begin to talk again. And then comes in this one man, he's, I gotta tell you, compared to the rest, he's well dressed. He's the constant intellectual. Him and John start speaking in different languages. Greek, Aramaic, they even do some in Hebrew. Man, you can tell he's a little bit better dressed. No doubt it's Matthew. Man, he's a constant. He understands money and the world. They even talk about different people. 
When he looked at me, you could tell he was a little guarded about what's he doing here. He didn't know me. But by the same token, he was every bit of kind to me. He shook my hand and he proceeded in. And then not long after that, in came Bartholomew. And then came Philip. Man, Philip, he's a big man. You can tell he's pretty robust. You can tell he's also a fisherman. You can see his skin is somewhat leather. When he shook your hand, he had that old man strength. That he shook your hand, you knew your hand had been shaken. He was very much guarded. He may have embraced John, but that wasn't going to happen with me. But by the same token, or Dolly, they're both a little bit up in age, but both of them have to tell you, they seem to have known each other almost in a prior life. They acknowledged me, but they didn't give me a whole lot of do. They can see they were wrapped up in their own conversation. Tradition holds that they were married. That's why I'm talking to families. And as a result of such, man, they started to become in one time after another. Here comes Thaddeus. Thaddeus is a guy's guy. He's a little taller than the rest. And you could say he's distant and he doesn't care. He came in, he embraced John, but not like the rest of them. And he just nodded to me. There were no handshakes. He was guarded, but by the same token, he walked away from a lot as well. I remember later in life, he would be speared to death. He was nice to me, but no more than that. And then he goes to take his seat. The brother and sister in Christ. And then the one comes in, he's got the greatest disposition of them all. He's just got a sense of humor about him that just seems to radiate. Everybody liked him. As a matter of fact, they would call him as he walked in. It was Thomas. He had a disposition that everybody wanted to be. Everybody wants to be with Thomas. Outside of maybe John. Man, him and John hit it off right. He even gave me a hug as he walked in. Man, he lived up to his reputation. He doesn't know a stranger. He no sooner gets in and begins to sit. John and I begin to talk again. And then I realize it's probably time to get seated. And then all of a sudden, my brother sits in Christ. I can see it's almost like everybody stood still. It's almost like everything in the room changed. It got cold. I didn't know where to sit, so I turned to tell John. And the guy that walked in, man, he, he, he looked like, like somebody, like the world was on his shoulders. He looked overwhelmed. His clothes were tattered and torn. He looked disheveled. He looked nervous. Man, he was sweating. He was perspiring. As a matter of fact, every, no one even acknowledged him outside of John. Even John really didn't hug him. He called me over, but I didn't know if he called me over to introduce him. Me to Judas, or just to make sure I was closer to him. When I tell you that man looked at me, his eyes were pitch black. And I'm not just talking about the iris itself, I'm talking about the eye was pitch black. He said a shiver down my spine, I'll never forget. I remember him taking a step back as if somehow another man could make touch. He walks by me and he goes to sit on the inside of that bench. I don't think much of it at the time. And then as John says, well, I think it's time to take our seats. I begin to walk and then I notice John says, as he leans over and whispers, you need to sit on the bench. And I remember thinking, of all people, I looked at John as if to say, well, why? I'm not even supposed to be here. But I don't want to sit next to him. I wish I had the courage to say it, but I just didn't. As I began to walk me around the table to see me, man, all of a sudden the door opens up. Make no mistake about it. Everybody got up from the table when Peter walked in. You can say he's not the rock. You can say he's not the lead apostle. You can say he's not Protoss. You can say what you want. But at the end of the day, everybody recognized Peter. Peter did not go to them, they went to Peter. He actually embraced each and every one of them. Held them by their shoulders, asked them how they were, and everyone gave their due. Judas never moved. John brought me along, and I gotta tell you, Peter gave me the book, make no mistake about it. Your fault, my fault, nobody's fault. There better be nothing that goes wrong here. 
because you were here. But you're welcome. He was in arms just as he shook my hand, and I gotta tell you, that is one big man. He is thick, he is robust, he is determined, he is resilient. His grip made Phillips and then look like a man that didn't even know how to shake a hand. You can tell he'd been on the water. His skin was almost like a leather. You could see his eyes and creases. It looks like he'd been through the rain. He was gracious enough to say, well, any friend of John's is a friend of his. And then he said, please have a seat. He just looked at Judas. That would have been enough to walk on a man's knees. I go to sit next to Judas. I sit on this much of a bench. I don't want to touch him. I don't want to be near him. I have so lost my focus. I am so distracted because of where I sit. I didn't even see Christ walk into the room. I am staring at Judas' side. I can tell you the description of his ear. I can tell you his nose. I can tell you his jawline. I can tell you his hair. I can tell you his clothes. I am staring at him saying, so you're, you're the one. And I hear John say, Mark, come. I'm almost like in a daze. I look up. The Messiah. The one I heard about at the pool of Salon. He's got eyes that are so blue. He, he knew me. You can't tell me he didn't know my name. You can't tell me he didn't know my name in my mother's room. He, he knew everything about me. I was so embarrassed because I knew that he knew. I also knew he would not say nothing. Every one of them got up to embrace him. Peter is the one he spent the time with. When he came to me, John introduced me. He took everything I had just to stand in front of him. Part of me just wanted to drop to the ground and say, forgive me, Lord, for I know not what I do. Depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. When I tell you he embraces, with a love that permeates the very bowel of your bones. I'm not even sure I was standing as much as it was if he was holding. I remember thinking, my Lord, my God, why have I forsaken you? He gave me a look of love and he walked off and I was still standing. As a matter of fact, we were all sitting the table. John had to get me. And almost pulled me back to my seat. I sat again next to Judas. I actually moved over so that I wouldn't touch him. I actually couldn't help but keep looking at him. The Messiah of the world is across the table. And I am so distracted at who this guy is. My focus should have been when I am. The way he came. All the times in the boat. Martha and Mary, Lazarus, the blind sea, the lame walk, the dead eyes, the poor, the blind man, the Sabbath, the lepers, Lazarus himself, the miracles that came in his fingertips. And I'm stuck with Judas. I want to shake him. I want to say, man, can you just, can you just not, not do it? I don't even 
want to give up for my, my, own, my own peace. And then I hear the immortal words, my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. If I'm not in you, you are not in me, you will not have eternal life. I'll watch you raise the bread. I'll watch you raise that chalice. Judas leaves before he partakes. So distracted. I'm almost watching the doors if I'm waiting for you to come back and say, Be a good one. Come out to the They say, No, it's over. They're going to the garden. But I can't go with them. I'm not part of the 12. All because I got distracted. He'd been in our city over three years. He never took the time to go meet him, to study him, to talk to him, to listen. All the distractions of the world. The brothers and sisters of Christ. Nothing changed in 2,000 years. We are distracted. If there's ever any time in your life that you and I need to focus on one thing and one thing only, it's Jesus Christ. You have one job, and only one job. It's to make it to heaven. Your profession is irrelevant. Your job is to get you and your family to heaven. Every time you get distracted because of what somebody said, what somebody did, what somebody wrote on an email, the internet, or Facebook, what somebody did in the parking lot, what somebody said, that somebody gossiped or slandered or belittled or condemned. Remember, you are never neutral to Jesus Christ. In everything that you do, you're either walking towards Him or you're walking away from Him. Do not allow yourself to get distracted because there will come a day when you will stand before Him, naked and alone. There will be no arbitration. There will be no mediation. There will be no... Nothing. There will only be judgment. You and I will hear only one or two statements. What could hold my son, my daughter? Oh, how I have waited for you. Well done, my child. Come. Come to me. Or you'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. Ah, those distractions. They took you from me. For both sisters in Christ, I leave you with the words of Winston Churchill. And I'm paraphrasing. You will never reach your goal. You will never reach your goal if you stop and throw rocks at every barking dog. Be on guard of those distractions that come from the evil one. Your soul is at stake. Amen? Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.